You are listening to an event recorded at Houseman's Bookshop. For more recorded talks and forthcoming events, please visit Houseman's website. That's what this book is primarily about. Um, I was joking earlier on with Mackenzie that you can't judge a book by its cover. This is a book you can judge by its cover, because I don't know how many of you have done this yet, but if you um, open up the dust jacket, you get these. And first, so the publishers have kindly sent um, some along tonight, so these are free. So after the talk, if you want to help yourself to the dust jacket, at least please feel free, and I'm sure Mackenzie will talk about how you came about that. So, as I say, thanks very much for coming. It's great privilege to have you here. Over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Malcolm, and thanks to this even worked. I think it's worked. I think I, I think I can address space that big. It does work. Does it make any difference? Yeah, yeah. it does. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for coming. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so why write another book on the Situationist International? Uh, are there not enough already? Uh, well, yes, but I wanted to write one that uh, might speak to the present moment. Uh, and when I say present moment, it's something I was working on you know, for the last four or five years. I didn't quite realise how interesting the actual present moment of 2011 would turn out to be. Uh, so it turned out to be like a little bit more uh, contemporary than even I intended. Uh, and, and most likely in a good way. I mean, who really knows what the future holds in, say, Tunisia or Egypt? It, it gets more interesting from this point, does it not? Uh, but, you know, a certain break has been made uh, in those places. So, um, I wanted to write a book that would uh, go back to this moment, the 1950s and 1960s, and find you know, threads that one could use for thinking about contemporary situations. Uh, because I kept sort of thinking, there's resources there that we haven't really kind of quite uh, made the best use of in terms of uh, critical practices, critical theories, the relationship between politics and aesthetics, and that sort of thing. So, and, and I also th thought that there's a kind of privileging of what you might call high theory uh, in sort of intellectual discourse on the left, meaning you know the idea of philosophy as the king of the disciplines. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to sort of counter that and write a book that's about what I would call low theory, which is sort of the the attempt to grapple conceptually with the experience of everyday life. Uh, at least partially outside the space of universities and the official art world and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's the, the idea of c critically conceptualising what it is one does in everyday life is something I, I think should be within everyone's grasp. It shouldn't necessarily be something that requires uh, formal training. I'm certainly not against people studying things in a formal sense. And I am myself a university professor, so, you know, it's not an either-or thing. It's an it's and also. There is also this practice of thinking about the everyday. Uh, so I was just going to read a little bit and, uh, and you know, this is sort of opening overture uh, and talk just very briefly about the range of things that are, that are kind of in it uh, and then discussion, dialogue and so forth. A giant inflatable dog turd broke loose from its moorings outside the Paul Clay Centre in Switzerland and brought down power lines before coming to a halt in the grounds of a children's home. The Paul McCarthy sculpture, the size of a house, reached a maximum altitude of 200 metres. Other civilizations had their chosen forms, from the obelisk of Luxor to Michelangelo's David. The futurist poet Marinetti found his crashed motor car more beautiful than the winged victory of Samothrace, but he might have balked at flying dog shit. In the 21st century, the insomnia of reason does not breed monsters, but pets. No wonder there are no longer any gods when what is expected of them is that they descend from Mount Olympus with plastic baggies and clean up. We are bored with this planet. It has seen better centuries. And the promise of better times to come eludes us. The possibilities of this world and these times seems dismal and dull. All it offers at best is spectacles of disintegration. Capitalism or barbarism. Those are the choices. This is an epoch governed by this blackmail. Either more and more of the same, or the end times. Or so they say. We don't buy it. It's time to start scheming on how to leave the 21st century. The pessimists are right, things cannot go on as they are. 
The optimists are right, another world is possible. The means are at our disposal, our species being is as builder of worlds. Sometimes to go forward, one has to go back. Back to the scene of the crime, back to the moment when the situation seemed open, before the gun went off, before the race of champions started. This is a story about a small band of artists and writers whose habits were bohemian at best, delinquent at worst, who set off with no formal training and equipped with little besides their wits to change the world. As Guy de Bord, unintentional dramatic pause at that moment, mm. as Guy de Bord later wrote, it is known that initially the situationists wanted at the very least to build cities, the environment suitable to the unlimited deployment of new passions. But of course this was not easy, so we found ourselves forced to do much more. Where does one find that kind of ambition now? These days, artists are happy to settle for a little notoriety, a good dealer, a retrospective. Artists renounce the desire to give form to the world. Having ceased to be modern and finding it too passé to be postmodern, art is now merely contemporary, which seems to mean nothing more than yesterday's art at today's prices. <laughs> if anything, theory has turned out even worse. It found its utopia, and it's the academy. A colonnade adorned with busts of famous fathers, Jacques Lacan, the bourgeois magus, Louis Althusser, the throttler of concepts, Jacques Derrida, the dandy of difference, Gilles Deleuze, the take it from behind, Michel Foucault, the one-eyed powerhouse. Acolytes and Epigonies pace furiously up and down, prostrating themselves before one master, ah, betrayed, and then another. The production of new dead masters to imitate can barely keep up with consumer demand, prompting some to chisel statues of new demigods while they are still alive. Alain Badieu, the Maoist of the Mathene, Giorgio Agam, the pensive peasant, Slavo Zizek, the neuro-Hegelian joker. Beneath the pavement, the beach. It's now a well-worn slogan from the May-June events, Paris, 1968, at the moment when two kinds of critique seemed to come together. One was communist and demanded equality. The other was bohemian and demanded difference. The former gets erased from historical memory as if one of the world's great general strikes never happened. The latter is rendered in a language that makes it seem benign, banal even as if all that was demanded was customer service. As uh, Luke Boltanski writes, whole sections of the artistic critique of capitalism were integrated into management rhetoric. What is lost is the combined power of critique of both wage labor and of everyday life expressed in acts. What has escaped the institutionalization of high theory is the possibility of low theory, of a critical thought indifferent <coughs> to the institutional forms of the academy or the art world. A low theory dedicated to the practice that is critique and the critique that is practice. And so, two steps back that they might enable three steps forward. Back to the 50s and 60s when another 21st century seemed possible. Back to the few, the happy few, who thought they had discovered how to leave the 20th century for sunnier climes, though not quite as warming as ours. We do not lack for accounts of the Letterist International, 1952 to 1957, and the Situations International, 1957 to 1972, that succeeded it. The beach beneath the street claims no originality whatsoever. Rather, it's a question of retrieving a past specific to the demands of this present, an account that resists the sorting and selecting which parcels out of movement into bite-sized morsels, uh, each to be swallowed by a specific discipline, art history, media studies, architecture, philosophy, and so on. The Situationist Project implied the overcoming of separate and specialised knowledge and has to be recalled in that spirit. And just let me get to the, the peroration. Guy spent a lot of time working on how to remember situations, how to document them and keep them in a way that could ignite future possibilities. For the most part, he created legends. When legend becomes fact, print the legend, as the newspaper man says at the end of The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. Much of the literature on the situation seems designed to be disabling, to prevent any real creative use of this body of work for critical practice in the 21st century. The authorities on this period delight in drawing attention to the follies then committed, as if their own complacency of thought was in some sense a higher achievement. Then, all can be safely consigned to the archive, enclosed in a time one can visit like a tourist before returning home to the workaday world. The beach beneath the street makes more than occasional reference to the events of the more recent past in which the cogency of situationist thought and action still registers. Leaving the 20th century was the aim of the Situationist International. Leaving the 21st century might not be a bad ambition 
on paper at least, we have longer to achieve it. So that's the, I, <laughs> I skipped a bit where I kind of rant about some other people and, and, and please don't take it personally, I've ranted against myself as a you know, sort of academic in there as well. Uh, but I think it's important to rant against one's own you know, self as well as those of others. Uh, so the chapters that follow uh, cover the material that may be familiar to some people. Who here has read Society of the Spectacle by Heath Hall? Yeah, quite, quite a few people. Anyone have uh, Ken Nab's situation psychology somewhere? Yeah, this is <laughs> this is stuff that. Uh, and and if one doesn't know this, I don't mean to exclude you from the conversation. It's like, go read it. It's great stuff. It's in fact all free online. Too. Professor, couldn't you give us a little background for those? Absolutely. Yes, I'm I'm happy to do that, and I'm gonna. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing this by way of saying that there's some stuff that some folks know well, but it's a book that also tries to sort of reintroduce from a slightly different perspective, uh, a movement that uh, some would say begins in Paris in the 1950s, but I want to decenter the story away from Paris a little bit as well. It's a less Paris-centric version of this story. Uh, I wanted to put the sort of the peripheral folks back into the story. I wanted to put women back into the story. I would have liked to have put the North Africans back into the story and got less far with that, because it's just not documented. It's not, you know, I couldn't get it, but that was... I've certainly done my best to, to include that piece of the story as well. Uh, I want to include the people who are excluded from official accounts because they're excommunicated. Uh, and there are only ever 72 members of the Situations International. I haven't told all of the stories by any means, but I wanted to pick up some of the threads, uh, which would include... Uh, the wonderful novels Michelle Bernstein wrote in the early 60s. Uh, because when, when one talks about everyday life, the, you know, the, the famous version of this is the derive, the, the wandering of the streets, uh, a, a, an experience of the city outside of the divide between work time and leisure time. If you can attempt to adhere to uh, Guy Debord's famous early slogan, never work, which is the second hardest thing he ever attempted. <laughs> the hardest is make no art. This is actually impossible, it turns out. One, one never, that's, it's what one does when you're not working. Uh, there's, there's kind of an interesting paradox about that. Uh, so, but, but to kind of experience the city uh, outside of that divide between work and leisure, uh, the derive, the drift, uh, which might then give you a sense of uh, ambiences that are glimmers of the possibility of a completely different city that isn't governed by the commodity, private property, or the necessity to work. So it's the sense that this would be a method through which one discovers how space could be otherwise. So this is the sort of classic version of this story. The thing is that, you know, wandering around drunk at night in packs is a bit of a young man's game. Uh, you know, and I personally am too old for it. My feet give out. Uh, so and I, I wanted other versions that don't necessarily you know, conform to that version of how one might do this. And one version is Michelle Bernstein's. Uh, so she writes two novels uh, the best account of the Derive is actually her second novel, which is yet to be translated, but the first one is available in English uh, under the title All the King's Horses. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic account of a love triangle, and, and this is, of course, well-worn territory. I think it's, you know, she's parodying the chiclet at the time. Uh, de Beauvoir's version of this story is probably in the back of her mind. But is it possible to think about the dynamics of love and sex outside of the idea of property? That, that you are mine and you have betrayed my ownership of you in having a relationship with somebody else. Is it possible to think otherwise about that kind of event? And I think that what she does in the novels is attempt to do that. Uh, the, the novels are strip mined for biographical details because it's thinly veiled versions of her real life, but they're interesting as novels and I wanted to restore that sense that here's a writing about love and sex as games and a strategy, but which is never less sincere. It's, it's not about play acting in the sense of something false. It's, this is sincere feelings that characters have. But, but can it, you know, is it possible to negotiate the space of those kinds of relationships within the space of the city without invoking proprietary rights? And that struck me as a really important thing that she attempted to do. So I try and tell that story. Uh, situations are connected to May 68 in people's minds. Uh, uh, René Vianney once said, our ideas are on everybody's minds. The thing is, their actual role in those events is fairly negligible, but they kind of anticipate how boredom leads to action. Uh, and I, I tell Vinay's story at the, at the end of it. Uh, 
but besides that sense of uh, everyday action in the street, I want to tell the story of... Uh, is anyone Dutch here, by the way? Constant Neumannhus. And no one has been able to tell me yet how I'm supposed to pronounce that. But he went by the name Constant. Uh, he's a truly remarkable uh, artist. He decided to uh, abandon painting altogether, and he made models and drawings of... It's not just an imagined utopian city, it's an imagined utopian planet is, is the scale of his ambition. He imagines a, a completely alternative infrastructure for the entire planet. And that to me is the most ambitious project anybody in, in 20th century art ever attempted. Uh, now he breaks with uh, the board. The board thinks this is saint Simonian utopianism and so on, and he's not wrong about that. But is it not the case that one has to think about the infrastructure that makes everyday life possible? You know, what would a critique of the infrastructure of London really be like? If you think about how massive it is, the freeways, the water system, the power grid, you know, why, why does one never think about the reconfiguring of, of space on that scale? And Constant did that, you know. So those would be two of the stories that I want to reintegrate into the narrative. Uh, Alexander Trocky is probably the least likable character in the whole of uh, uh, Anglophone literature, a uh, truly horrible kind of uh, uh, unredeemable junkie, uh, but who wrote Kane's book, which is a fantastic account uh, of, of uh, derived life, li uh, life lived outside of uh, labour. Uh, he wrote some really amazing porn, which is actually better than, I think, than Kane's book. And, and I make the somewhat tendentious claim that he invented blogging in 1964. <laughs> now, you may ask, how would he have access to the internet, which did not quite exist outside of a few, you know, sort of military industrial uh, spheres? It was done with radio machines, right? So he's doing like radio machines, and of course everyone was using radio machines. But he, but he imagines a kind of, uh, a, a, what he calls a log. It's it's like web log. It's almost there. You know, the idea of an iterative process of collaborative writing. Uh, where you get away from the sense of the sole authored book. He's already experimenting with this in the 1960s. Uh, and he starts to imagine alternative economies for the whole of... Uh, he has this weird Leninist thing where, where he wants a kind of... Uh, a parallel set of cultural institutions outside of the commodity system altogether. Uh, but, of course, he was such a horrible, screwed-up junkie that none of it ever actually happened. But the texts are kind of wonderfully luminous. You can see projects can be picked up uh, and further from that. Um, I wanted to revisit Henri Lefebvre, who's one of the key sort of intellectual uh, figures here. Uh, de Bourg borrows uh, an enormous amount of society respectable from Lefebvre, and I, it's a connection that I don't think had been quite acknowledged. And it's a connection that went both ways. There's lots of Lefebvre that's from de Bourg. So here's a whole kind of take on everyday life and what he called not the situation, but moment. How do moments crystallize? crystallise out of collective activity in everyday life, and can that be practised aesthetically and also politically uh, as a way of, you know, sort of not, you know, being a sort of Stalinist in the party and all that sort of stuff, he left all that behind. So it seems to be something quite contemporary in how Lefebvre was trying to think these things. The other thing about Lefebvre is that the sort of the central idea of about 20 well-known uh, late 20th century philosophers, is all in Lefebvre. You can find Derrida in Lefebvre, you can find Rancière in Lefebvre. It's just Lefebvre was such a sort of um, uneven writer that he never pursued an idea far enough to actually become famous for particular ideas that other people, I think, really picked up from him and later developed. So um, what I've done is try to tell a sort of a range of stories of all of the things that were, uh, that fissured off from uh, situationist practice uh, in the 50s and 60s, and the book ends in 1968, because uh, that's a sort of, a, I think, a kind of turning point. And not necessarily 68 just in terms of Paris, but it's a kind of world historical uh, turning point. Uh, this is uh, the revolt against Stalinism in Czechoslovakia. Uh, it's the, probably more or less the high point of uh, cultural revolution in China. And what everyone thinks about all these events, they're, they're kind of fulcrums on which kind of history turned at that moment. And whether or not a revolution was actually possible in 1968, it may well not have been. It still seems to me to be a significant moment that it didn't happen. And uh, René Vianney, who I write about at the end of the book, gives us this wonderful way of categorising the world in which we now live. We've heard about 
uh, the underdeveloped world and the developing world and the developed world. This is a language that, that's been used in global economics for some time. Vinay talks about the overdeveloped world. And is that not a wonderful way of thinking about where we've ended up? What if we overshot a certain turning point? Whether or not the turning point was even real and ended up in an overdeveloped world that kind of feeds on itself, that spins its wheels, that tries to invent new commodities out of new desires that aren't really there and which keeps collapsing back into boredom, you know, over and over again. And then is not boredom also a useful key for thinking about the politics of the present? Uh, is that not one of the drivers uh, that causes uh, a kind of crisis of confidence in the solidity of what the board would have called society the spectacle in the early 21st century? So I think I'll leave off the sort of presentation bits of it, and I'm happy to sort of pick up any of those and expand on uh, or, or engage with anything. Uh, from the four game. Any thoughts in the audience? I was wondering what place there is for religion in the contemporary situationist movement. Because De Boer yeah, it's interesting. kind of, well, he's read, read a couple of essays about religion, and then, uh, I think even at the one, one time, but I was wondering whether you can see. Uh, something occurring that uses similar tactics or strategies or ideas? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a third generation atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm yeah. religion, I'm, I just yeah. want to, because... Uh, no, but I, but as a way of explaining that, I, I actually find religion really interesting. I find the rituals <laughs> really, really fascinating. Uh, so things like uh, when I've, you know, I have to go to church with my relatives, communion makes me burst into tears. <laughs> I thought, my God, it's the body and blood of Christ. <laughs> and you, you're there in a church where everyone's going, yeah, okay, stick the wafer on my tongue. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, that is amazing. Uh, Satyrs, you know, next year in Jerusalem, the, the empty chair for Elijah to return. I just get, I'm getting goose pimples now just thinking about it. Because I'm a third generation atheist, like the power of those narratives to me is just absolutely astonishing. You know, and, and, I, and to me it's available because I don't feel like I have to push religion away to establish my secularism because I'm a third generation secular person. Uh, Debord was even more so, I think, and there's actually an interesting way in which Debord secularizes things like potlatch and gift and all of these quasi-mystical categories that are so central to how anthropology thinks. And he gets it from Georges Bataille where it's all about you know, you, you can never expend enough into the sort of infinite void in which God doesn't exist, is where, you know, sort of uh, George Bataille ends up thinking in the 50s. And the board is like, actually, gift's not about that at all. Gift is about strategy. It's about, I'm going to expend this and dare you to top that. And if you don't, I'm expelling you from the movement, you know, so it becomes this kind of secular game. So the but that to me is what's interesting, is, is that situations that strongly secularise something that's profoundly connected to uh, religious experience. And that very, very centrally uh, interested someone who I spent two chapters on, Aski Yorn, who described himself as a mystical materialist. And how do you square that circle? You know? But for him, what's valid in uh, religious experience is uh, the indescribability of life and nature itself and that's that's the whole whole uh, so that's John's whole work is trying to sort of fathom that as a practicing artist he thinks that what nature does is experiment with uh, forms uh, most of which are ugly and fail but every now and then a new form is seeded into the world and becomes you know a new aspect of life and Jorn thinks that's the artist's role that's what the artist does so there to me is a couple of keys for how you could think about how it connects to something about which I actually know nothing because if I go to, you know, uh, a Seder and it's like, whoa, whoa, that's chairs for Elijah. I obviously have no idea what I'm talking about mm -hmm. in terms of that particular set of uh, rituals and traditions and so forth. Isn't the other thing, though, that the society, the spectacle, is taking Ludwig Feuerbach's essence of Christianity and replacing the word God with spectacle throughout? Yes, you'd read that, and Feuerbach is, is plagiarised and, and quoted in, in the text. I mean, lots, yeah. of, lots, of, yeah. you know, lots of samples are taken yeah. from, 
before he backs critique of Christianity and we, we in, in the society of spectacle. So yeah. he's in sense says we've gone from the world of religion into the world of the spectacle. Yeah, and, and it, it seems clear that uh, there's at least something about the spectacular domain that, mm. that's sort of mired in a certain kind of official, it is official <coughs> religion now. There's a sense in which we, we now have saints who last for 15 minutes, yeah. and then there are new saints. And, and well, Van Eyck makes the same point, doesn't he? As a yeah. critique of the, you know, his, you know, critique, you know, his revolution of everyday life, he's mm. making the same. He actually makes that very clear, that we move from religion to media. <laughs> yes, although I didn't write about him in this book. I saved him for a sequel. Ah. That's coming to so. Yeah. No, no Van Eyck, Van free. Yeah. Why was that? I'm surprised to hear that. This is a remarkable... Uh, mm. Mission. On the face of it, so you must have had a good reason or readily identifiable reason. Uh, it's it's that this book is from you know roughly 1949 to 1968, and Van is still alive and writing. And in fact, most of his writing occurs after 68. And I wanted to initially I wanted to do all of it. I wanted to write about his whole body of work uh, because he's you know there's I don't know how many books he's written. It's 20 or so, and they're, but they're mostly in this later period. So, and, and the books of his I find interesting, there's two on heresy, and those are the ones I essentially want to write about. But his, his I, I assume, his uh, most significant work very much falls within the area that you were... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Some years, uh, society respect. Well, yeah, certainly his best known book is, the one that's known in English is Revolution of Everyday Life. But I actually don't necessarily think it's his best book. And I want to put that in the context of a longer trajectory of thinking about, about his work. Yeah. It's his so first, it's, it's his it's first book. It's his it first sounds book. like your omission then is, is a merely ar arbitrary question of, t of uh, chronology. Could be. I'd cop to that. I'm staggered. Well, <laughs> well I, I'm writing a book. I have to make decisions. <laughs> and uh, Van Eyham's body of work is mostly post-68, so it seems pretty reasonable to not put him in this one, put him in the other one. I'm all in too. Yeah. That's the same reason for Sanguinetti then, presumably. Sanguinetti volume two. Yeah. Because he, he doesn't join until 69, I think it is. Right. Like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yes, I am writing about particularly the, the famous censor mm. book, which is a truly extraordinary moment. Yeah. yeah. It's great to ask about volume two, isn't it? It's like sort of marketing, but <laughs> our, 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 our factory records and the Hacienda Club in volume two, or, <laughs> or were they just cynical marketeers? Mm. No, I, and you only want to talk about volume two because it's not out for another yeah, year. Yeah, it's yeah. it's uh, T.J. Clark, Ben Iham, Alice Becker Ho, Sanguinetti, uh, De Bord's later films, and De Bord's Game, Game of War, and some things I'm probably forgetting. But that's sort of a and it's it's a less coherent story. These are not necessarily things that you can put an umbrella around, so it's a little harder to write. Uh, but it seems to me that there's a series of things that you can use in the present. Now, because everyone talks about the 60s, but it's the 70s is the decade that sort of gets, it's as if it never happened, you know. Like, with the 60s, everyone claims they were there. No one claims they were there in the 70s. It's like, oh, no, I don't know. I was not there. I didn't do that. You know, it's, it's, there's something kind of problematic historically about that period in popular memory. So I want, that's, that's the part I want to get to in the second one. Because it all goes bad in the 70s, yeah? That's, that's the thing about it. Yes? Um, I wonder if you could suggest, you said, that, like, uh, part of your project is kind of reclaiming stuff in the present. Uh, perhaps you could suggest, or maybe it's implied by what you've missed out with the book, um, where the situation is like moving along, or where tactics of theirs, or, or ideas of theirs are perhaps redundant now. Uh, yeah, I mean, Du Bois writes some beautiful things about this later in life. You know, theories are made to die in the war of time. It just strikes me as, yeah, things work and then they don't work. So I didn't necessarily <laughs> want to uh, revive this and say, apply it now. It's more, here's an example of the application of thought to a situation. How do you reconceive the exercise in the present rather than sort of reinvent all of this now? Uh, so, and there's certainly some uh, texts from the 60s that, and early 70s that, that to my taste, uh, start to uh, traffic in a kind of a dogmatic language that sometimes is used deliberately and artfully and sometimes kind of not. Uh, but even then, there's things you can extract. So, like, René Vianney, I think, is kind of underappreciated as a, as a writer. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't necessarily want to advocate, you know, one, one must follow the line 
And this is it. It's more, here are examples of tactics. But uh, the way that things uh, you know, collapse into acceptable domains of practice, things get recuperated into. This is literature, this is art, uh, this is scholarship. There's nothing necessarily wrong with literature, art, or scholarship, but are these things not better when there's a kind of critical edge pointed both in and against it at the same time? Yeah? Do you think um, De Boer would have appreciated the way that it concepts like uh, corporate flash mobs using advertising kind of take business and kind of put them in the spectacle. How have you thought about that? Uh, I mean, he was al already writing about the recuperation of all this stuff, uh, uh, particularly after uh, 68, and arguably the movement's dissolved in 72, because in a sense it's already been kind of recuperated. The newspapers are talking about spectacle and so on. And uh, Yeah, you, you can uh, uh, find plenty of folks in, you know, name your field, info marketing, whatever, who know this stuff. Uh, and, and I think that the board wants to sort of both distance himself from that, but also kind of take credit for having been recuperated. There's a certain subtlety to the, to the way he kind of finesses that. Uh, and he writes in the, I think it's in the comments on the Society of the Spectacle, you know, this book will be of interest only to, you know, a few handfuls of people, you know, some of whom are dedicated to the maintenance of the spectacle and the others are dedicated to its overthrow, you know, something like that. So it's a, it's a very sort of grandiose sense of having been of use to the other side. You know, it's kind too of easy them. to be depoliticised then. Of course, but, but that's, it's, it, in that sense it's not unique. Like there's, it's, it's to think about the way in which uh, what he would call spectacle has that capacity to be all-embracing in terms of content. What it's not so happy about is challenges to the commodity form. And it's not as if one can construct an entire alternative outside of the commodity form, but there's definitely tactics and strategies for advancing that which is not commodified in everyday life and culture and so on. And, and that, I think, is the game. There's at least three or four versions of what uh, gift economy and culture could be like in situations as practice. You know? For example, Jorn made a ton of money uh, as an artist uh, from the late 50s, particularly early 60s, and he gave it away to the Situations International in the form of paintings. So he would ship a painting off to the board, the board sells it through dealers, and that funds the whole thing. So it's a kind of gift relation. Uh, the journal was famously beautifully produced and expensive, but the content was not copyrighted. The previous journal, Potlatch, was you know cheap mimeograph thing, which was never sold, it was given away. So there's at least three versions of the gift. And we have, on the one hand, better tools for doing all of those things, and yet which are incorporated into uh, a yet more refined version of spectacle from which you know, certain corporations extract a rent no matter what you say or do. So it's sort of understanding the sort of dialectical tension within those things, but also what tactics are available, it strikes me as you know, where one might go with this in the present. I just wanted to, in relation to contemporary, well, now, present world, uh, there were sightings of uh, King Mob in the student right, well, demonstrations and uh, I was just wondering if you've done any writing within the book regarding King Mob uh, as part of the situation this kind of protest movement group No I didn't but someone someone should do a book on mm. on that well, I've been writing about it myself though. Yes, yes, I, I would not be the person uh, you know uh, but uh, is, 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 is that not one of the... But it's also linked yeah. to, you know, mm. King Mob publication here in the 70s, isn't mm. it? Then the sex pistols and all that stuff. Yeah, it's... it's and like 1780 a, Gordon Riots as well in, in London. Specifically English is stories, which, which English. As, a, as a, you know, as a Francophile, I actually don't know it well English enough. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was... Uh, wandering around uh, Limehouse this morning with a, an interviewer and, and I failed to find the Siemens mission <laughs> where, the, where the famous uh, you know, conference of the SI happened in whatever it was, 61, because I, I think it's, it's a, oh, yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm not the person who's equipped to do that. It's taken me this long to figure out the kind of French context, and, which involved walking all the bloody streets that are on the mm. famous map to figure mm. out, oh, okay, mm. so this is what it would have meant you know, half a century ago. But yeah, I think there, there are, is an important series of not just English, but but you know, sort of British stories that need to be told, and it's it's sort of not yet 
out, but I think there are folks even in this audience who are working on revisiting that and retelling that story. But Trocky is the bit that I've done, is, is to sort of investigate that, but of course Scottish rather than English, and spent, did most of his stuff outside of the country that's of interest, but here's this figure that I think needs to be investigated and reclaimed for, you know, as, as, uh, as one would say, what's living and what's dead in these particular histories. Yeah. I was just thinking about contemporary culture. Um, I don't really know too much about situationism, but would you say it, it seems to be like a little light bulb moment, thinking about going to Burning Man and the gift economy and the whole idea of a spectacle and everyone's uh, is, is part of the show, no spectators, you know, you are and there's no, you don't have to be an artist, have a license, you know, that says I'm an artist to, to do art and everything's kind of art and the whole thing's a show. I'm presuming there's a sort of direct link there between uh, Situationism and, and that kind of thing. I, if, if there is, I haven't found it. There, there was a whole series of um, uh, very interesting uh, art practices that start uh, in San Francisco, and, and it sort of seeds off from that and, and becomes a monster eventually. It's this whole huge, you know, kind of event of you know, almost global, not quite, but almost global proportions. Uh, and it's a great kind of parallel story, and, it's, and there's. A sense in which it's it's not as conceptual; it's much more based in practices, um, but but really interesting. And there's a film about it that's around. If you Google, I think it's even just called Burning Man, and there's you know the documentation is starting to come out to investigate that. Um, but in telling these stories, one of the things I'm trying to to gesture towards is there are all of these other stories, practices, concepts. Let's get to work on those and investigate them and, and remember them properly. Uh, try to extract what's you know useful from it. Uh, you know, as opposed to a certain kind of official history of this is what art's supposed to be, this is what philosophy's supposed to be. It's like, well, can we just kind of get away with ignoring that a little bit and to spend more time on this on this other set of stories, of which that you have another, I think, great example. We can ask you something about Paris, just because um, I do educational tours with kids and uh, mm. American kids. I tend to Paris. I try and explain a little bit about 68, but obviously, you know, not in great depth because they're basically on an extended holiday. Mm. But um, <laughs> when I, I, it's interesting to hear you talking about boredom as, as, a, as a driver mm. because I've, I've read a few things about 68 that basically write it off as here are some middle class students, they get a little bit bored, mm. they kick off a little bit, and then, you know, then they go back to um, the class with the tails between the legs as soon as there's a little bit of kind of resistance from the state. I just wanted to, so it's quite interesting to hear you talk about boredom as a driver, mm. as an actual. Some but I mean, the other side of '68, it, it was a general strike yes. in, in all but name, and, and if certain forces, including the French Communist Party, hadn't held it back, it might have become a general strike. Uh, and so that's what makes it sort of significantly different from the idea of '68 as sort of the the, the the signifier of student protest. It's like it's not. It's that's you know. Mm. A sort of a, a, a little subset and a more visible one of something that's, I think, much more important, the occupation of the factories, of which there are very few actual photographs to start with. So the image of 68, there's always, you know, a bunch of people in the street or, you know, cops. It's like, well, here's this whole other thing going on at that moment that makes it really an event of a different colour. But it's hard to explain this to, you know, how many students have I, have I ever had, you know, that actually work in factories? Like I used to get them, but now they're fewer and fewer. So even just explaining what working class life used to be like mm. to not all, but obviously to a lot of students is now actually kind of difficult. It's like, this is what factories used to be like, you know, in places like the United States and, and Britain and so forth. You could say the same thing about what's happened in Egypt. There's a lot of the trade union activity and strikes that went on mm. before, prior to the revolution that were disregarded in favour. We're talking about yeah. um, yeah, and it's not to devalue the, the, the spatial politics and the symbolic politics of occupying a significant site. I mean, this is, this, is a, this is something that has effectiveness and so forth. But yeah, it's, it's clearly not the whole story. And as with any really interesting event, I don't think we'll actually really even know what happened in Egypt for a few years yet until those stories are kind of teased out. I wanted to go back to the thing of the, <coughs> the everyday and the fair, but you mentioned the fair. Mm. And how do you get around personally to this thing? How can we avoid uh, idealizing the everyday? Could you speak up a little bit? We get a bit strong in the back. It's how can we avoid idealizing the everyday, if yeah. I can paraphrase. And it, it's clear that the everyday has been colonized. I also think of Lukács. Mm. Mm. And uh, how, how can we get away from idealizing? One, one question. Because the everyday 
might be the colonized bit, might be the real, the ordinary life, but also the kind of the everyday sucks, essentially. <laughs> and also, it's also boring as well. And, and then, is there room for escape in this? And could the escape transcendence, uh, could derive what you were saying, be the transcendence here? That is also legitimate to want to escape. And also, I was a bit, uh, I felt a bit, I don't know, Trocky, but you you mentioned the word junkie and horrible. Slave. Or, sorry, mate. Uh, junkie and horrible at the same time. And it, it felt a bit, I had a, a funny response to that. Oh, I, I don't want to suggest all junkies are horrible, but in the subset of junkies, Trocky was a horrible junkie. Okay. Okay. You know. What qualifies him as horrible? Because I don't Pimping out his old friends. Yeah, ripping <laughs> people off. And, uh, yeah, so I didn't want to necessarily, you know, so to, to be quite clear, in the subset of junkies, he's one of, he's horrible. But, and, and this is not really arguable in, in, in terms of his biography. Yeah. It's, it's really just an awful, awful story. Yeah. But, but it's also that um, I don't think it's necessary that the people who are interesting be heroes with a capital H, like they don't have to have led exemplary lives to be of interest, is the, the, the point I was trying to make about Trocky. Uh, the everyday, what's interesting about uh, the Fairman, it makes him a little different, both to um, Lukash and to what, how the board sometimes gets read, is he talks about uh, alienation and disalienation, that there are, there are, if you like, practices of reconnection. Uh, that there are tactics, that there's a game that that's, can be played in the space of everyday life. Uh, and, and one might even hear echoes of uh, Deleuze and Guattari's territorialization, deterritorialization in that. In fact, I think that's where it comes from. They get it from him, I think. Uh, so, so that's what's interesting about how he's like a little different, that, that it's trying to resist, well, not, not resist with a capital R, but to, to think outside of that, that sort of uh, flip-flop between thinking uh, the whole of everyday life is so utterly colonised that all I can do is, you know, be depressed by by the in the corner and you know drink another whiskey. Like they're trying not to. He's trying not to end up in that space. He's also trying not to go down the road. Uh, Michel Desoto <laughs> goes down, which is to sort of valorise and celebrate the everyday as it already is. So the thing in Lefebvre is is the everyday is a space in which practices can uh, be experimented with and some will crystallise out into moments and some won't. But in a sense, that's the game, is, is the politico aesthetic of trying to construct things within that space. So that, to me, is what's interesting about Lefebvre, is, is avoiding that very stark sort of dualistic picture. And what do you think is current in the sense of what could be helpful in de decolonising the everyday? Uh, I don't know if it's a, it's a kind of a... Funny question. Or not. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to give uh, examples of things that happen in the present because not everyone wants to be publicised. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think all this stuff is dead and buried and it's available for everyone to, to pick the bones over. But um, the answer is kind of look around you. There, there's, you know, uh, there's thousands of interesting practices right. going on. Uh, and of course, they, they all tend to be you know, minor and local and specific, or if they're networks, they're very tenuous networks and so on. Uh, so, you know, let's not kind of kid ourselves. There, there's a yawning gap between uh, the, the critique of the totality and the practice in the everyday. But the gap is a good thing. You know, if, if your theory and your practice are completely aligned and at one with each other, you're probably not able to really think at all anymore. You know, the, the gap is the productive thing. That, that here's how far critique can reach, but here's the limits to what I can actually physically do. That's a very, very useful place to think from, I think, and to act from, for that matter. Because the other thing is, is you cut your thinking to suit what you can actually do. You know, it's, that's, are we not always encouraged to do that? It's like, well, if I buy the red brand products, you know, a fraction of a, of a cent will go to the people of Rwanda, and, and this is a good thing in the world. Well, not really. You know? so, so it's that constraining of, of thought that I wanted to uh, oppose, in a sense. It just suddenly struck me sitting here that um, even though... 99.9% probably the population of this country have never heard of the situationists, that there's this sense in which um, the situationist phenomenon constitutes the most spectacular irony mm. 
in contemporary, in contemporary culture. I noticed the other week when I checked uh, on the internet that a copy of the original Boucher Chastel edition of uh, La Société du Spectacle comes in at fourteen thousand pounds. Perhaps I regret having left my copy out of my hands. Uh, I lent it to a friend a few years back, and that Van Eigen, the the the, uh, the Gallimard edition of Van Eigen's uh, Traité pour savoir vivre comes in at the bargain price of eight hundred pounds. Um, I find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to identify any response uh, post-1972, say, to the situationist phenomenon, which uh, de Boer, at any rate, uh, would not almost certainly have regarded as the work, and I use the word advisedly, of mere recuperationist scum. Um, <laughs> would you consider that your effort falls into <laughs> you are you're calling me recuperation no, scum. No, not at all. I'm merely asking questions. Uh, I, I, I happily cop to that. Yes, I'm, I'm recuperation of scum. <laughs> because what else can you do, right? Yeah. Well, actually, there are some things, and and I can I can top your story because a, a complete set of the journal is about three thousand pounds. And that only gets well, you no, the no, second no. edition of number two. You know, I mean, it's well, that's a bargain compared with the Boucher Chastel at fourteen thousand. Oh, fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand. Did I fourteen thousand? Right. Yeah. Okay. No, sorry. So I can't talk. About I'm, uh, right. But but what I wanted to say is that the contents of most of those texts are some of the most freely circulated texts you could possibly imagine if you've got you know the internet at your disposal, uh, and, and that to me is the the interestingly perverse. Uh, double side to this, that at one and the same time, yes, of course, I mean, it's, it's always the most, you know, kind of extravagant, interesting uh, attempts to escape what, in Ford's terms, would be society of the spectacle, become those things most valued by it. Uh, I mean, he's now a, a, an official living treasure uh, of the French state, you know, so they could stop his papers being sold to Yale, you know, it's, but, but of course, that's exactly who it happens to. That's who it happens to. Uh, and it's the paradox in that if you are uh, a really kind of uh, diligent uh, functionary of the state version of culture, ten years after you're dead, no one gives a damn about you. But if you resisted it to that extent, you're the one who gets remembered. Uh, you know, so, so that's the paradox of the cultural space that we occupy. Uh, so while you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that some folks will actually buy the book and help keep Verso in business, I, it would not surprise me if the contents of this are already available free somewhere, you know, and and that's not a bad thing. Like that's the the, the tensional paradox of, of commodity and gift in relation to each other. Uh, so yeah, there's one does what one can, and I'm a recuperator. I, I work for a university. Yeah. Okay, so what's your attitude towards the the, the the modern state then? To give you a a let out clause, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, a personal question that it, may it, not be evident in the volume itself, so I ask from a genuine spirit of inquiry. Uh, I, mean, I think my, my position on that changed really completely moving from uh, Australia to the United States, uh, <laughs> because th there's a sense in which uh, you know, social democracy in Australia is po still a possible project and not necessarily a bad one, uh, so to, to put my you know, sort of moderate hat on. But in the United States, it's not. Uh, uh, the ruling class is on the offensive and winning sort of massively. Uh, and, and so there's a sense in which one wonders whether the state's a viable project at all for anyone. And so it's what, what can you sort of retreat to and defend would be how one would think in that particular space. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that, that one pursues thought uh, to the limit, but one practices what one can context. But sorry, it was... Uh, oh, it was just a, a, a little thing that came up today. Um, someone was actually put, sent down for six months for stealing Argos catalogues, uh, which are actually free. <laughs> and, um, uh, in, during the riots. And um, interestingly enough, Argos catalogues from the 1990s sell for uh, 20 pounds. <laughs> And ones from uh, two years ago sell for four pounds on eBay. So um, 
perhaps they were thinking about a crime of something that in the future <coughs> would no longer <laughs> <laughs> a, Thank you for that astonishing story. <laughs> <laughs> it, it immediately makes me think of that there's a wonderful book by uh, Peter Weinborg called The Lon London Hanged, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which is, well, how was uh, the everyday life of you know, commodity culture established in the first place? And it, it's by violence. I've often said to him, you should have called it the London Hanged and Transported, because, you know, there's, there was another punishment, because <laughs> banishment from, from the British Isles, you know. Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Australia being like one of them, you know, that was one place that people were transported to. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, it's, it's not natural that one acts as if the commodity is a thing and one buys and sells everything, you know, there, there are breaches of this convention. Or always were, always are. Like, they're, like you know, uh, uh, riots are not exceptions. Right? They happen all the time. They just happen in different places. They're not always reported. Yeah. Um, could you say something about language? I know you're talking about French authors, but you used fulcrum and Fisher's Fisher's verbs in your talk. Do you feel you have the right to take any noun and make it a verb? And do, you <laughs> and do you think, this may not really be part of what you're talking about, do you think the divide between academic talk and ordinary lay talk is a tragic thing? Why can't academics write like ordinary people? Is it the market? You're talking about commodification. Is it the demands of your market? If this question is not of interest to anyone else, just disregard it. No, it is. Oh, I, I'm really interested in language. Really uh, but I, I think I parcel it out a bit differently. I, mean, I think everyday uh, spoken English is amazingly inventive and, and turns nouns into verbs and verbs into nouns and uh, portmanteau words uh, and words that are kind of covers for other words. There's all sorts of things that everyday language does that's, that's uh, poetics. Uh, and uh, but it's mostly a verbal art, and all I can do is, in a sense, uh, duplicate that in the space of the written word and say, well, that's also a space that can be invented and creative, and I don't necessarily want to take the meaning of words as given. And one of the projects of the situations was a situations dictionary, which would be to actually define, uh, you know, redefine words from everyday life, and, and that struck me as, you know, kind of really interesting uh, project. Uh, so... Yeah, there's, there's several, that's, that's one dimension. Um, the other is I wanted to write, you know, a fairly challenging, uh, difficult book, but where the keys to understanding what it's doing are actually in the book itself. Uh, in, in the United States, and I suspect in the future in Britain, you know, you, you pull a book off a bookshelf and it says it's £10, but its real cost is £60,000 because that's how much education you would need to sort of mm. start to figure out what it is. And I didn't really want to do that, but it's, I didn't necessarily want to... Uh, write a book that leaves language as we use it unchallenged. I wanted to push back a little bit, uh, but not not to fetishize, you know, that act either. So it's, I think it's a kind of a tactics about language uh, to occasionally sort of disrupt how we use it, but without. Uh, and and poetry is fine. It's a wonderful thing, but I don't want to be doing uh, late modern poetry where that's the whole game of making language difficult and something you have to think about constantly. But in, in, I mean, English is different than French, or at least I think so, in, in that there's two Englishes, and one's Saxon and one's Norman, right? And, and, uh, and, and this, is, this becomes a politics, which is that uh, all of the everyday, ordinary words you find tend to be Saxon. The abstract nouns are all Norman, and there, there's an imposition of a ruling class in its point of view. Centuries ago, that left that imprint. So the question is, do you only write in Saxon? And there's a lot of English that essentially is just that. But it's not particularly conceptual. It's not thoughtful. Do you try to make the Saxon version of English conceptual? Or do you try to reappropriate the Norman side of the language, uh, which is the bits that sound like Latin, as they sort of are, uh, and, and you know, bring those into ordinary, everyday discourse? So even the word spectacle, you notice has resonance. People know what you mean, or think they know what you mean when you talk about spectacle. You know, it's not an ordinary, it's not an ordinary everyday English word, but, you know. Spectacle? Spectacle, yeah. Spectacle. <laughs>
Yeah, that, that's sure. quite interesting because it's a lot more common in France, isn't it? Yeah. It's an everyday word, theatre. Yeah. It, it, or the theatre. Sure. Yeah. Mm. So that when the book came out for a French person, how would they read that title? Well, there's an anecdote that's probably not true that the publishers thought it was uh, a book of gossip about loveys, you know, people <laughs> in the world of theatre. You know? I don't know if that's really a true story, but, but oh, it's exciting spectacle. That's like, yeah, theatre folk. Yeah. So you can translate the title of it. Yeah, yeah you can translate the title as yeah. theatre folk. Or you can even translate it. Do people use, still use the word loveys? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, that would make a really weird translation yeah. of the title. But, but, you know, this is more Georges Perec territory of how you, you know, like, translate differently. It's an interesting way of thinking about that book, you know. Uh, I, mean, I, I wrote a book, uh, uh, Hacker Manifesto, that's, that's almost exclusively in, in Norman English, uh, which turned out to be incredibly translatable uh, into everything except Greek, because Greek has its own abstract language. But the abstract language, it turns out, of a lot of European languages uh, has, has what for us is Norman, but, but is this general Latinate language. Uh, so there, there is a politics of where conceptual language comes from, who gets to use it, I think one ought to ask questions about. I don't necessarily have the solution to it. Uh, didn't John Paul Sartre write a series of essays sometime called The Situation? He did. Yep. Those were written as a predated uh, Oh, yeah, and, and uh, yeah. the situationists most likely borrow yeah. the situation from him and, and from uh, being a nothingness, but I think they're doing something different with him. But this, this gets us into a footnote that I don't necessarily know that we want to get into. <laughs> Why exactly did you write this book? No, for the money. question, if not stupid. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's several answers to that. Um, one is that I used to teach uh, Grail Marcus's book. You ever know Grail Marcus's book, Lipstick Traces? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've tried to teach that, and my students don't like it. Uh, like, they don't get it. Uh, like, like, sex pistols happened before they were born. You know, it's not... Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's a sort of... To me, it's, a, it's the romantic version of the story as well. So I think... It's a book I didn't quite agree with, although it's a book I loved and it's important to me. So I wanted a book that would work now with my own students. That's one version of the story. Another is I really wanted to write about avant-garde movements I was in, in the 80s and 90s. And my thought was, is there one book we all read? Like, it was all so disparate. I was looking for a thread. And we all read Society of the Spectacle. I had to go back and read it again. It's like, holy crap, that's not the book I thought it was. It's, mm. it's mm -hmm. much, much richer and more interesting. That's another version of the story. Uh, another version of the story is I really like the board's later writing, and I've been trying to understand it for 20 years, and this was part of the, you know, getting to that point of, what is he doing later? Like, that I'm, I'm kind of interested in. So there's, there's different versions. Another version of the story is that there's the sort of official, the board-centred version of the story. At the moment, there's counter-narratives that are anti uh, the board and value the other folks, and I want to try and put the two together. Uh, to not see it as this thing that was still a, a space of conflict. Let's figure out what's at stake in the splits and the differences rather than take sides between them. So there's, there's a few things I thought were worth worth kind of doing, uh, you know, in the present. And, and you know, just, just to add one more, that uh, we've got, you know, yet another version of the high theory version of how one thinks critically. And I, I wanted to restore that sense of... Uh, every day and, and of the sort of non-institutional space uh, is something that's sort of, you know, also important and worth valuing. So there's probably five or six other reasons, but I'm, you know. It's a boring question for the author, right? So I don't want to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this links to, I think, uh, these two people that one one's about burning a man and you're talking about finding, reclaiming one's kind of everyday consciousness. Uh, it's part of the everyday outdoors and well, indoors. Mm. But the Hacker Manifesto, mm. which you wrote a while back. What's that? Didn't hear that. Uh, the Hacker Manifesto uh, is linked to hacking, and I think one of the contemporary practices of the day that represents a new form of, say, psychogeography through networks and technology is hacking. And it's about reclaiming space, with reclaiming a consciousness or some kind of pseudo version of authenticity or something. And I just wanted to, if you uh, could actually refer to maybe some practices, or mm. uh, you, don't have you don't have to specify any individuals, but <laughs> actions that are happening that relate maybe contemporary versions that might not be specifically situationist influenced, but relate to it. Hacker Manifesto is a book I wrote in a non-existent language called European, 
Uh, there's eight <laughs> translations into other European languages, and I consider them all equal. I don't think the English one's better than the French. They're actually all translations from a non-existent European. Mm. Uh, which And European is, is Church Latin, Business English, and Marxism, the three things that you know, are, are consistent across the continent from one side to the other, you know, more or less. Uh, but the one word in it that's not is hack, which is a fantastic Saxon you know, sort of word. It, can that become a concept? Can we get out of the demonising of hackers as this or that, or the, the treating of it as subculture and so on, and make it a concept? What does it mean to hack? And I wanted to broaden it a bit beyond uh, computing, but to understand how the digital is a sort of fundamental transformation of the whole of the labour process and the whole of everyday life. So that was you know, what was central to that book. And people always say to me, there's no examples in the book. And it's like, well, we all lived the examples, or at least when I say we, you know, the people I wrote it for lived them. So I don't need to or don't want to say exactly what they were. It was a whole bunch of stuff that we did in the 80s and 90s, of which it's the, you know, the, the tract, or at least my version of the tract. <coughs> but how was the digital space that allowed you to decommodify in new ways and create networks that weren't otherwise possible, sort of very cheaply and effectively? Uh, and up until 2004, that still seemed like a viable project. Uh, but I, I'm, I've, I've I, a little, I little more pessimistic that, about I, it now. I understand that, but I'm, I'm yeah. talking other forms of hacking that don't mm. involve digital as well. You know, uh, in other ways, it's people are coming out of the internet mm. and using mm. those ideas yeah. uh, and reclaiming everyday space and rehacking social context. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, that's a whole popular social movement that's happening all over the place. And, and there are various sort of... Uh, above ground expressions of that, so sort of hack labs and hack spaces. Uh, I have a graduate student who's trying to just inventory them and he keeps finding dozens of more spaces <laughs> that people just create in which to make things and do things, some of which is technical, some of which is not. Uh, and when it works well, it's putting together things like uh, you know, courses and how to use computers with the knitting club and, and with you know, all sorts of different things that different sorts of people are interested in what to do. Uh, yeah, because the, the you know, fact is commodity economies don't work without these other ones. Uh, but how do you make them something other than just support systems so that you know, rent can be extracted from commodity economies? That's kind of the whole game, in a sense. Whether it's in physical space or whatever one calls it now, uh, virtual space. Do you see a, a difference in how um, situation is in, in Britain uh, were different from uh, France, I believe, in Scandinavia, the whereas the uh, situation is in? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, in this book I've tried to write about Aske Yorn and take him seriously as a theorist, and also as, as someone who uh, you know, leaves the Communist Party and creates alternative practices, and his practice was to form networks all over Europe. Uh, and, and he, he theorises Bohemia, and he's one of the few people who ever did. Like he, he doesn't romanticise it, he theorises what the practice of the artist is. So Jorn was very interesting. And he funds, uh, as well as the board, he funds a whole kind of uh, breakaway movement, uh, of which his brother is at the centre. Uh, it's a kind of complicated story, and I don't speak Scandinavian languages, so I couldn't really pursue it. Uh, there is a book out just now that starts to sort of document in English. Uh, the sort of Scandinavian version, that's a little bit more uh, agitprop oriented. Uh, it's a little bit less kind of conceptual and a little bit more coming out of expressionism as, as Jorn was as well. So it's kind of interesting, but I personally don't find it as rich. But there's that, there's the German uh, Gruppe Spur, uh, most of whom end badly, but you know, it's central to uh, the sort of non-parliamentary left in Germany. Uh, so there are all sorts of stories. There's, there's Jacqueline de Jong's Situations Time, so I do write about that, because uh, I found that piece to be interesting. So yes, it's not all about uh, what's happening in, in France. Here are all of these other uh, kind of versions. I haven't done England, because I think it, you know, English yeah. people have to excavate that and England. tell that story. No. Uh, I'm, I'm told, I don't know the second hand, that Charlie Radcliffe has written a memoir that's like a thousand pages long and no one will publish. I don't know if that's factually true, I've just heard that second hand. It's like, we would all love to read that and, and get that piece of the story. Uh, and I'm, I'm writing about Tim Clark, or TJ Clark, in the second book, uh, who, who becomes a famous academic. You know, that's the thing. He becomes one of the great art historians uh, of his time. Can you say uh, a bit more? You began talking about um, 
low, low theory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but everything seems to be on a theoretical level. Um, well, what I'm piecing together to understand what the, the situation is all about, uh, I just see it on a, because I wasn't there, I see it on a theoretical level. Um, can you bring in uh, what uh, a natural practice was, uh, the kind of low theory uh, as you were putting it? You know, kind of like, what was it in practice? Uh, I mean, it's different practices at different points in its history. So it's, uh, you know, for the proto-situationists uh, in Paris in the 50s, it's, it's can you live outside of uh, full-time labour? You know, is it possible to live outside of work? It's kind of not completely possible to do that unless you're, you know, uh, uh, have a trust fund or something, but to attempt it. But it's a kind of a young person's game to kind of live completely outside of that space. So there's a kind of uh, a, a compromise with the conventions of being an artistic avant-garde in the founding of Situations International. Uh, but to what extent can you sort of refuse incorporation into the art world? It then becomes you know, the, the next game, if you like. But just the everyday attempt to put out a freaking journal. You know, there's uh, the board who had famously written Never Work is writing, you know, in 19... 50, whatever it was, in the early 60s, is writing, I've never worked harder in my life. You know, he's trying to run an international organisation, he's trying to put out a journal, uh, he's trying to you know, conduct this extensive correspondence with people all over Europe. And we now think of Europe as one space. It's not in the 50s and 60s. There's customs borders between all of the states. Uh, it doesn't have a lingua franca. You know, there are all these obstacles to you know, sort of conducting this kind of practice. As there are now to a global practice, yeah? Uh, if it was hard in the 50s to have a European practice, it's, it's hard now to have a global practice. That strikes me as you know, kind of interesting. There's a great text of Yawns that not many people got to read because it got seized by the customs agents on the way back into France. And it's like, well, there are no borders between France and its neighbouring European countries anymore, but then there were, you know. So, so that's the kind of stuff, you know. Or Yawn uh, giving away the paintings to support all of these avant-garde movements, you know, like the gift... Uh, there's a really fantastic uh, museum that he built in his hometown of really all of the interesting uh, post-war European modernist artists. And it, it's a great collection. And, and the other great collections of that kind were built by patrons who bought the paintings. Jorn built it by swapping paintings. He would give people his, he would give people other people's paintings, so he used the gift to build a great collection, and it's still there. Like, that to me is a practice, you know. To what extent could a gift economy construct a whole museum? He did it. He proved you could do it. So one could multiply examples, but to me that's the sort of thing. Prol uh, Constant trying to imagine, you know, a completely alternative utopian planet. You know, like that also is a practice in a sense. I'm struggling to understand what the way you do and practice low art. I'm not entirely convinced because it seems you struggle both. Fields and, and echoing what uh, he was just saying, I still don't see how this law art manifests in the way. And anyway, what I would say, what's wrong with high art? Uh, I, nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, this is not a moment where I find it particularly interesting. Uh, so, in what way? It's, it's not my job to be interested in it. In it's, what way it's your, job to, you know, your way of articulating this and doing this mm. differs? I mean, I'm very, very interested in art practices. Uh, what is I'm, that? It's, it's how do you live a life that makes things? You know, that, that to me is, is the like question. Like doing conferences and teaching philosophy? And you play that's game. what you, you, that's play what you do for a living. Like, you know, one, one has I mean, to do certain things that, to make a living, and that's what we all do, right? That, but, but what's the other little, part, you know? How do you do low art? How do you... What is it? It's, to me, it sounds like it's like a, another fetish, low art practice. What? Well, and, and I, right. by which I don't necessarily mean outsider art, and there's another way you could think about it. No, it's, it's often, uh, you know, people who are quite well schooled and aware of aesthetic traditions, but there's, there's always a kind of internal uh, divide in a practice. And that's quite specific, because you're making usually sort of sp specific objects, so there are particular economies that that necessarily gets caught up in. But they don't have to be. Like, there are other economies, there are other practices. I mean, I don't really know what it's like here, but uh, in New York, you know, the dealers come to the graduate show at Columbia, 
mm. and sign up the top three. And then they're in group shows, then they're in uh, solo shows a few years later if it worked out. And if not, they're teaching out in Ohio. You know, like it's a system <laughs> and that's fine. I'm not against folks, you know, trying to make a living doing that sort of thing. But, but what's interesting about what anybody's doing seems to me to be what else, you know? What else? What's the part of everyday life that, that can be lived outside of official culture and, uh, and so on? And it's, and it's not to sort of fetishize oppositionalism. One can be opposed to all those things. Maybe it's a more subtle game where, you know, one has to play in those spaces in order to do something else. Because uh, to some extent, you know, the ball makes certain compromises in his life. And, and, and you know, I, I admire the extent he, he managed to limit the number of compromises he had to make. It's actually pretty impressive. But, you know, there, there is no kind of pure life. You know, one does what one can to invent practices of the everyday. That's, that's art to me, is the everyday. I think we have time for one more before my brain gives out complete voice for that matter. If anyone's got any last thoughts? Well, I just wanted to deal with his mm. point in a yeah. way. Because I think that there has been a low of... Uh, 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 a mass creativity, or say alternative art, and maybe not define itself as low art, but it crosses over into different fields. Some of it's uh, like technology and engineering, some of it's through anarchist art projects, some of it's through <coughs> net art that is on, on the internet, some of it's uh, projects that just use maps in, in the streets. It, there's, <coughs> there's loads of it out there that can link as an alternate art history to say high art uh, that's not publicly seen, mm. that has mm. its own grassroots context that is influenced by some situations and but also by other uh, different types of uh, reasons, some of it hacking and some of it uh, just by deliberately trying to make art that doesn't fit in galleries as well. And some of it is radical, it's in galleries, and some of it's Radical. That's outside of it, but equally interesting. And I mean, when it's not Jorn, Jorn tried to rewrite the history of art, and he limited himself to European art, but he thought you had to rewrite ten thousand years of it. Yeah. You know the, that. I mean, he thought the Renaissance was a mistake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So th there was a kind of th you know very very strong sense of uh, how do uh, aesthetic practices become uh, classical, which is a bad word in, in his universe. Uh, and become mirrors of the ideal world of a ruling class. You know, to what extent are you know, art, uh, artworks sort of captured and, and made into sort of mirrors of the ideal world you know, a ruling class would like to imagine and inhabit, where all of the messy, complicated stuff about nature and labour and the everyday is excluded. Mm -hmm. So you know, the other art could, to begin with, be that which includes those things, puts those things back in. You know, that might be a place to start in kind of thinking about that project, but. That then gets kind of complicated, and certain tactics have to be thought about, and so on. You know, but that might be the starting point. But we've sort of forgotten you on, and, and the breadth of the vision that he had for that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the 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 he had a what was it called a, a project on comparative vandalism? You know, it was, was one of the projects that he had going. He was spending money on photographers photographing, you know, vandal very broadly, goths, Visigoths, you know, the whole thing. Like here's his other version of what European art history is like. That's, that's popular, that doesn't have right angles in it, that's attempting to uh, invent forms in a way analogous to the way nature does. And you're, you're, you know, it's interesting, profound, possibly wrong, but you know, there's a richness there. Yeah. Sorry, you said the last person, but I'll be the, <laughs> <laughs> the person <laughs> after the last one. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been interested in what you've been saying uh, just recently about uh, art, sort of low art, the work of, of Yawn. I know that I mean, Jorn was doing these things, but eventually this led to a split between him and uh, Guy Debord and Vienna and the others. And isn't there a much more radical critique of art contained in the, those situations to actually rejected the art, so rejected the direction of Jorn and Constant? And isn't this the critique of art that's contained there analogous to Marx's critique of religion in the early manuscripts, in that this is art as such is an alienated activity. We do not have the opportunity 
to be creative in our everyday lives. The, 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 the strictures of this society prevent this. Or they inhibit it to a great deal. And so what do people do? Well, they go off into their garrets and put up an easel and daub a picture of, of what their perfect world would look like, what their, how their aspirations are realised. Just as religious people go off into a church and undergo these interesting rituals and, and affirm their, their belief in the sayings of the founders. So I think... Aren't you actually retreating from the more advanced positions of the situationists when you say that there is a space for some kind of liberatory art? I mean, shouldn't we be following a position that says art is actually um, an analogous practice to religion and we need to cre critique both of them, and the society that creates them, and not indulge ourselves in a little bit of uh, liberation art. I mean, there's a few, there's a few <laughs> things to that. The, you know, the, the sort of the so-called in, in the political stage, they weren't consistent about the original <coughs> thing. They, they, they do a show in, in Scandinavia, for example. Mm. Uh, so they weren't kind of quite consistent about that. They were still funded by Jorn. And, and he writes uh, an astonishing letter uh, or well, how it ends up in the, in the board's correspondence it turns out to be a complicated story. You want to this astonishing thing, which is, which is even if it's necessary for you to break with me, you know, the, the, the sort of the economic basis of the movement is secure. He has a kind of slightly, you know, tactful way of saying that turn against me and I'll still give you this gift. And you sort of think about that, it's like, what a bastard, you know? So we're going to turn against you and you're still going to give us the gift that keeps us going. Like, to me, that's an extraordinary gesture that he makes. So that, that would be one thing. The other is that you don't necessarily uh, escape from the limits of an art practice with a writing practice, which is essentially what they did. Mm -hmm. the, the point where uh, Debord does is the so-called mm -hmm. Hamburg Theses, and, and the reason it escapes is that they didn't write them at all, right? But then he writes a letter about not writing them, so even that gets caught in the commodity <laughs> system. So mm -hmm. it's, like, that's the thing, is, is that the problem with the critique of art which, you know, is, is a valid and interesting one, is that it's partial, is that, you know, it doesn't go that next step of saying, well, you know, is it not always the case that you're caught with the complicated business of finding tactics in relation to commodification in everyday life? And art's kind of interesting and specific because you make usually singular things as opposed to a mass-produced practice like writing. Mm -hmm. But writing is still caught up in the culture industry. It's still caught up in spectacle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, maybe there are different ways one practices in those different domains. And, and yours is this astonishing gift, you know. Uh, Debord's is, is, you know, in a sense, giving away the content of the journal, but not the journal. You know, the journal is expensive. You know, there are, like, weird little wrinkles and complications. And I think it's... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, helpful to pay attention to, to that uh, rather than go, I'm exempt because I'm not doing X. Well, not doing X means you're doing Y, and Y is also something that, about which one could be mindful. Uh, but and I, I want to end with, uh, uh, you know, at least an English rendering of one of my favourite lines of the boards, which is to be at war with the whole world lightheartedly. <laughs> lightheartedly, you know, to, to in a sense not get into the, the, the space of holier than thou and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the, this is about something that is playful as well as something that is fundamentally serious. So I think I'll leave it at that point because I've exhausted my own ability to think. But um, what I was going to say, if you'll be hanging around, so if anybody wants to have a few words in a very informal yes. setting, which of I know course. some people prefer actually. And we can open the door as well, so it's not quite as oppressively warm in here. By the book. Very much by the book. Yes, and of course, yeah. And <laughs> to do with the money and first, so and there are the free posters here. We told there you about earlier on. Yeah. Free posters on. But